Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about the role that Botanical Gardens and Arboreta play in rescuing plant diversity and connecting people to the natural world with our special guests, Mary Brinegar, President and CEO of the Dallas Arboretum, Tony Kalenik, Director of the Mathai Botanical Garden, the Nichols Arboretum at the University of Michigan, and Brian Vogt, CEO of the Denver Botanic Garden. So thank you all for joining us. You know, I've always been a real fan of botanic gardens. Uh, you know, it's it, it's always been so joyful to be in the middle of all these growing things and then to uh, see children and uh, adults all sort of communing, grandparents, parents, uh, all uh, interacting, people who might not have anything in common but their love for growing things. Let's talk a little bit about each of your operations, and then uh, discuss how you connect people to the natural world. And then we can talk a little bit more about uh, some of the intersecting programs that you have. Mary, uh, could you talk a little bit about the scale of the Dallas Arboretum's uh, operations? Okay, we have a 66-acre operation that is on White Rock Lake in Dallas. We have a, a staff of 170 full-time, but it usually goes to 271 uh, during most of the, the busy times of our year. We are a display garden. It is a subset of botanic gardens where we have a uh, bed display changed five times a year. That sounds like we're just a pretty place, but we are also committed to our particular mission which is not only the art and enjoyment of horticulture, which is to get people in the gate, education for adults and children, and research to return to the field. I wanna talk a little bit about what we're doing to help people in their own gardens to learn more, but to make it enjoyable so that they'll wanna come back and learn more, all feeding into our mission. And you're, and you're basically helping to connect people all around Dallas Correct. Right. We we don't live in a concreted overworld. We don't li uh, live in just an extractive world. Those are part of our daily experiences, but we also live in a growing world. You're actually connecting people to that fact. And and Tony, could you talk a little bit about how you? And we're going to come back to to you, Mary, because because I'd like to also talk about the the difficulty of of running an operation of your scale. But uh, moving over to Tony, you know, you have this, this different approach, right, in which you're talking about being attached to a renowned educational institution. Tony, could you just talk a little bit about what you're doing at, with, with a bit of a contrast to a, uh, to a city garden uh, uh, like, like that run by Mary? Sure. Thanks, Mark. The, there are fundamental similarities in that, uh, like Mary, you know, beauty and the uh, aesthetic experience are a gateway. You know, they are, it is, um, it gets to be both an ends and a means um, for us as well. I would describe us as um, a living learning laboratory um, for our campus community, but also in and with our community. Um, we're shifting our language right now, moving away uh, from our conceptualization of our um, visitors, from visitors to users and different forms of user engagement. Um, that's, that's a significant part of it. A lot of, our, uh, a lot of our heft and our capacity comes through our partnerships with campus entities. As you can imagine, we're working closely with faculty. We're tied into the curricular mission of the university and the bulk of our footprint. We have about 700 plus acres um, but the bulk of that is a, is a track right through the heart of campus that is part and parcel with it every university. 700 plus acres? Uh, that's interesting. I thought the botanical gardens were 300 acres, but, but are they larger? Well, so there are two primary locations, but five sites total. Um, so we also have a campus farm, and then we have two, uh, something called Mud, Mud Lake Bog and um, the Horner Woods, both of which we use for restoration ecology work. So that's uh, th that's really interesting. It's just it's just massive. And uh, Brian, could you talk a little bit about about uh, your botanic garden because you're at a different scale, in certain respects resembling more Mar the scale of Mary's operation, and you're in Denver, but you have a different nature and a different part of the country in which to in which uh, to uh, demonstrate 
horticultural craft. Yeah, I actually think we have a, a pretty unique circumstance. We have a 24 acre site near downtown Denver, and that has 50 gardens packed into it. So it's a uh, garden, 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 uh, not a lot of lawn. And then we have uh, to the south of the city, we have a 700 acre site called Chatfield Farms, where we work on regenerative agriculture and uh, restoration work. We have a riparian restoration zone and a, and a, a prairie zone. Then we have a site at about 12,000 feet up Mount Evans, and it's called Mount Goliath. And that has a mile long bristlecone walk, and it ends up in the highest uh, interpreted botanic garden in North America. It's uh, a beautiful alpine garden that we tend to. And then in South Aurora, we do all the programming for the Plains Conservation Center, uh, which is a pristine prairie to the east side of the city. And then real quick, we have a Center for Global Initiatives. We have a leadership role um, in a group called One World, One Water, talking about water conservation. We have a program called Plant Select, where we introduce uh, appropriate plants to the steppe regions. And we just launched the Idea Center for Public Gardens, which will help gardens all around the country work on inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Now, one of the things that I think is so interesting is the different career paths. Brian, staying with you, and then we'll go, we'll go to Mary. Could you talk a little bit about your own career path and, and what competencies are, are those that actually attach to running this institution with a team that, have, that share some overlapping competencies with you, but also have very distinctive competencies that they're contributing to your success? Well, I, can't, I have a hard time explaining my career because it makes no sense. Uh, my degree is in classical antiquity. Um, I grew up being the outdoor kid that always tended to the garden, uh, loved landscaping, um, wound up uh, in a job at a chamber of commerce for a very long time, um, helped form a city in, in the state of Colorado, um, then went on to serve in three different government uh, roles on the cabinet for the state of Colorado, mainly economic development and tourism. And then I've been at the gardens now for 15 years. I think the underlying uh, message through it all is I, I love working with great teams. And when the mission alignment is really powerful, then there's no end in sight. We can we can take it to uh, great heights. Well, also the service to civil society, right? I mean, yeah. this this whole idea of finding different ways to strengthen uh, American um, regions, America itself, right? Um, Beautifully by, said. By making contributions that are attached that attached to, to excellence, Mary. In, in the in the pre discussion, you were really it was very interesting. You were talking about the fact that you work with horticulturalists, you work with people who have these types of scientific expertise, but you're a manager. That's right. Talk, talk a little bit about, about how that ends up resonating within this type of a position in order to allow the Dallas Arboretum to achieve the thriving status that it has today. Uh, I have been in nonprofit management for some 30 years, 35 years before I came to the Dallas Arboretum. I had run the day-to-day -day management. Uh, I was associate general director of the Dallas Opera. I didn't know anything about opera when I came, but that's not what they hired me for. Prior to that, I was in public television. Then I worked for a science museum for a while. But they brought me in because, number one, they had operated in the red for years. Nonprofits are very, very fragile. And in our world, we were not close to our mission and we were, uh, as they said then, the best kept secret and down. Right. So we have to get focused. I think my strength, like Brian's, is I don't know what I don't know. So I want to talk to everybody that's knowledgeable in the field. We have uh, over 11 standing committees that have people from the community that are advising us on everything from arbor care to uh, gardens and grounds to architecture, whatever. We can't afford to make a mistake, but we need to recognize great individuals, move them up. And along the way, I learned a little bit, maybe dangerously, about too many topics, but I've enjoyed it. And we've operated as a an aggressive team and, and been in the black for 26 years. So. 
That is, that is just so great. Tony, uh, could you talk a little bit about your uh, your background and, and how that has equipped you with your teams? And then we're going to get to some questions uh, that, that are beginning to pop up. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, about your background and how uh, that integrates with the expertise of your teams? Yeah, it actually is really heartening to hear Brian and Mary's because it uh, feels like I'm in really good company here. The, uh, I also don't come from a botanical or horticultural or a really scientific um, background. I have a degree in uh, environmental policy, but then I went square into the humanities. And while I was doing that, I was publishing in the quantitative social sciences. And um, then I had a joint appointment between art and engineering. And I don't have a background in either of those. Uh, but the but I was in that role working with a uh, about 40 or 50 different universities and running a national organization called the Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities. And that was people who, it was full of people who are kind of in a post-disciplinary space, working with the universities to figure out what are the disciplines or the ways we can break disciplines to make better futures. And uh, in that capacity, I was working with people from computer science and art and nursing on a single project um, or watershed restoration and women's studies. And um, so it was just a, a, a series of amazing, deeply interdisciplinary work, all aimed at driving better societal outcomes. Uh, and that propelled me to a different role uh, at the University of Florida that was very public facing and publicly engaged. And um, from there, I returned to the University of Michigan um, to do this very publicly engaged work. And uh, that kind of a background, one thing, the one unifying capacity is that desire and um, trying to be the vanguard of, of breaking that barrier between uh, scholarly heft and public impact and allowing that power dynamic to flow the other way for universities to be informed far better than they are by uh, the public's with which they, um, which would they purport to serve in most cases, but really need to partner. I just love that that point, right? This this whole idea of, uh, first of all, understanding the environment. You all bring to the table the ability to understand the environment in which you're operating. Tony, it's it's very obvious that this sort of interaction that you've had with academics was absolutely key to running this type of an institution in this type of a place um, uh, uh, at, at the University of Michigan. Um, and each of you have that have those credentials. Can we talk a little bit about uh, this larger civil society question, which you each have raised uh, in different ways? Um, very often, these organizations are placed in little buckets, right? There's, there are arboreta, there are museums, cultural institutions, universities, as you said, Tony, right? This sort of separation with academia. Um, there's the whole question of justice in society, poverty housing, education for kids, what one is allowed to learn. Uh, could you just comment on how you see your role in greater society, not just as an arboretum, but beyond that? And let's start with you, Brian. Um, could you just uh, talk about how you view the operations that you manage and how you create that connection into other issues throughout the Denver area? Wow, that's a, a wonderful question because uh, we we talk frequently about our desire to change the world, and we do it audaciously, and we do it because uh, we all have to be thinking about that. We have to be thinking about uh, lifting up society and creating better ways of solving problems and creating opportunities and protecting our futures. Right. So uh, we're very much involved in in public outreach, education, engagement bringing in uh, new communities that maybe have never been to a garden before. Our diversity work has been really robust. Um, but a lot of the time we go out into the community and we try and help them kind of rethink what's happening in their own community. I'll give you an example. We have a, a community horticulture program where we're working with cities and counties all throughout Colorado to change up their plant palette for public horticulture. So that means street medians and what we call hell strips, the area between the sidewalk and the street. 
And uh, it's always been bluegrass and canopy trees and they die because they don't work here and they take tons of water. And we're saying do something more authentic uh, to space and place. And so we're, we're doing all new plant pellets. We have projects, like I say, going from uh, almost New Mexico up into Wyoming on this. And, and it's beginning to change some consciousness, just like our, hort- our agricultural work is about don't just plant vegetables, dump a bunch of chemicals on them, and then harvest them. Do it in a way that uh, sequesters carbon better, that builds better soil. Soil is king. Um, many, many civilizations have failed because they have depleted their soils. And, and we are at risk of doing that again in this country. So why not uh, take a different approach and, and grow really healthy food in a, in a way that is uh, building soil instead of depleting it? Just a couple well, of examples there. You've seen the deforestation of, of Greece in classical times. You saw the deforestation of, of Scotland in Roman times, right? And, and those areas have still not recovered. But then you have a place like the Adirondacks that were deforested in order to feed the steel mills with, with wood and, co- and, um, and coking uh, material. And those have recovered. Mary, um, how do you um, view this sort of intersectionality, the whole issue of when you when you look at what's happening on the news in Dallas, um, how do you see your function within a civil society, con- not just within a plant context or a gardening context, but in that in that context? Well, I think in order to be vital, you've got to be relevant. And so we need to be cutting edge and out there, the accepted authority on anything that's happening right now. For example, and uh, we have built an eight acre garden for children. It is all based on life and earth science, K through six. We have an omni globe that shows deforestation. I mean, it has 162 programs. It's seven feet tall, but we're talking anytime that there's a problem with weather coming in, what caused that kind of change? What is going on in the climate? There are relevant discussions all the time there, but people also want to know coming to the garden of how can I improve my life, sustain the life that we have right now, and what are best practices? So we have serious uh, levels of teaching at all kinds of uh, different levels, if you will, from uh, outdoor classrooms to uh, a lecture series for 250 people to doing shows every week on television. Uh, we're doing uh, different kinds of podcasts. And then with our children's program, we see 100,000 children a year just trying to teach them environmental messages in the children's garden. So you're you're reaching out beyond the conventional idea of you must come in and and visit. You do have, however, in this country, a real problem. We just completed a poll in which we asked in terms of visitation, how often has have our audience visited the uh, visited botanical gardens? And we find that uh, only 13 percent visit more than three times a year three or more times a year. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, 27% said never or rarely, or rarely right? Um, and then once or twice a year, maybe 60%. Right? So we have an audience issue. How do we turn that around? Because we can connect what is growing to our food supply. That's fairly obvious, but we also can connect what is growing trees and so on and so forth to global warming to places like Phoenix, which are having these, these heat bubbles, which are making the, you know, the city increasingly unlivable and, and trees providing shade can, can actually ameliorate that. Tony, uh, could you uh, sort of uh, latch on to the energy that Mary was describing about how these different modalities can engage people and talk a little bit about what you're doing with, with your resources over at the uh, resources at the University of Michigan? Yeah, there's a, um, this is a really helpful conversation just for me too, to hear about everything great going on in Dallas and, and across the state of Colorado and beyond. It sounds like the, the somewhat controversial opinion, but I, I think that botanical gardens in particular and Arboreta have, and uh, broadly speaking, certainly mine has uh, a marketing 
problem that is uh, to get to the results of that poll uh, in all of our materials. I just started 10 months ago, but the, our materials historically have shown beautiful images of our, the inside of our conservatory, let's say, you know, the sun's glistening, there's dew drops, there's beautiful plants and not a person to be found. It is a quiet, peaceful place. We, we market it as somehow removed from society as this escape from the day to day, which is not a reflection of reality. To take that kind of a picture, we have to wait until it's closed because there, otherwise there are families everywhere. There's all kinds of people taking the bus, you know, the whole thing. It's, these are active spaces. We are part and parcel of people's lives and we don't do ourselves, at least my speaking for my own words, we haven't done ourselves the favor of showing that we're not about the plants. We're about the relationship between human and non-human species. We're about Are you finding the same thing that that, that whole idea that, that the point that Tony's making about we're not just about the plants, we're about this communion, 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 and also human to human, right, Tony? That's right. Yeah, I would I would just add um, that's why you have to just continually shake it up. Um, I've been really inspired over the years by what Mary's done in Dallas and and. Uh, and so we we have added all kinds of activities, events, experiences at the gardens. We have a we have a movie theater at the gardens now where we show documentaries all day long. We have three indoor art galleries. We have a, we tripled the size of our library, made it a public library. Um, last year we had one point two six million visitors. One point two six. One point two six. And wow. And we now have broken through. We've got about 51,000 member households. And that's in a city the size of Denver, which is definitely not in the top 10 or 15 cities um, in, in the country. Well, if you look at the Dark because Museum, of they, would, they would love to have that attendance, right? I mean, right. you look at the various institutions. I, I hadn't imagined 1.26. That's, that's and, and about a third of that, just to be probably around 30 percent of that are people coming in from out of state. So we are almost always uh, number one on TripAdvisor of things to do in Denver. Um, so it's relationships building with your audiences over time and creating experiences that bring them back again and again and again. That's uh, it's just amazing. We just incidentally completed a, another poll. Uh, interestingly enough, we asked what kind of experience is most important to your understanding of conservation. And uh, we found kind of a tie uh, visits to botanical gardens, about 30%. A little bit more than 30 percent, uh, close to 40 percent. But then about uh, 30 percent each was visits to parks and wild places that places that are not curated. So let's talk about those not curated experiences versus curated experiences. Oh. And then about uh, uh, 30 percent also entertaining programming. So podcasts so the things that you were talking about, Mary, the things that you were talking about, uh, Brian. So so from a distance. So there there seems to be this opportunity for multidimensional um, experiences. So um, let's talk a little bit about the curated versus uncurated, starting with with uh, you, Tony and Brian, uh, talking a little bit about how you look at the wilder spaces that are under your management. And then, uh, Mary, if you can jump in with the idea of how do you curate when you have 66 acres, um, how do you curate that to give a real a real sense of wild when you don't necessarily have the space for wild? How do you do that? Uh, Tony, could you talk a little bit about how you use your wildlands first? And then, Brian, if you could jump in and then we'll go over to Mary. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I would say that uh, wild might be a misnomer a little bit in that 30 years ago, the reigning scientific paradigm was if we, if we leave this land alone, it will be conserved. And that's just not the case. Invasives are too prevalent now where to, to, to preserve and, con and conserve a natural community, we have to actively manage it, meaning we need to remove buckthorn. It's a war against buckthorn and honeysuckle, at least where I am, uh, Japanese silkgrass and other invasives that are um, winning, frankly. <laughs> and so in our case, we are seeking grants and, and receiving grants from a variety of partners, working with folks like Ducks Unlimited and um, National Fisheries and Wildlife uh, Foundation and, and uh, you know, legislative partners and clearing invasives from various species 
Um, and that work is something we teach about and talk about and interpret um, where and when we can. Uh, it often gets woven into classes. Um, but it is, um, wild is unfortunately uh, less and less possible. In the 20th You're percent. talking about cultivated wild, right? I mean, it's it, it's it's yeah. interesting, uh, but yeah. uh, I, I hadn't necessarily thought about it that way. But this whole idea of cultivated wild, we do a lot of work with people who are engaged in just that kind of work. Brian, are you are you also seeing that idea of cultivated wild? That's a great uh, term for wild? it. That's a great term for it. You know, downtown we have a site that showcases so many different plant tableaus that we hope will inspire people to then go experience them in other places. Um, and Coloradans are just historically very outdoorsy people anyway. So um, down at our Chatfield site, we have a stream going through called Deer Creek. And Deer Creek was channelized decades ago by the Army Corps, just like so many streams and rivers around the country which really took the, the healthy native nature out of the, out of the stream. So now we've gone through and we have an entire section where we got rid of invasives. We added more native plants and then we put in sod plugs to mimic beaver dams and that recreated the old oxbows and have refreshed that entire section of Deer Creek and, and native insects, native birds, native mammals all came back. Uh, we now have an active beaver population um, there that I think they got jealous because somebody else built the dams instead of them. And uh, it's been amazing. And we're doing that with uh, Prairie as well right now at a couple different sites. And in fact, we just we just met with a large golf course that, that straddles Aurora and Denver. And they've asked us to do a floristic inventory and then work on a restoration project for all of the surrounding parts because they have a riparian zone and a wetlands on the far end. And so there's a, there's tons of ways that we can do this work, but it's important to get, I like that cultivated wild. Um, it's a great way and, to check it. And a lot of that cultivation starts in places like Dallas. I mean, the, uh, we were mentioning also before the show, Lady Bird Johnson's whole initiative, which it, had it not taken place, so much of, of the wild um, uh, uh, plants of Texas would have been completely lost. Uh, Mary, could you talk a little bit about how your gardens and in, in your presentation uh, present um, that part of Texas history in a cultivated city environment, which then allows people to advocate for that throughout the state? Most certainly. We have always found that although we can do lectures, that people want to discover themselves. So we do a lot of walks and interpretive walks. We built a whole native Texas wetland uh, for our children's garden. We do pond dippings and scope testing. We want them to discover it and then to say, oh my gosh, what's happened to our water? So what we're doing, just like a, a person that's doing a birding walk, you never realized all the birds around you. What we want to do is when we're walking through our less cultivated areas and we're right on a lake. So we open up that fence and do walks around the lake. We want to show you what you might have missed otherwise. And our goal is to have you be an advocate for it afterwards. But we can also show you where some things are happening that are unhealthy for the environment. And then once again, people become excited they want to learn more, and then we give them those interpretive materials. You know, that hands-on point is so important. We're, we're just uh, completing a poll here, which has some very interesting results. What is the most important program or service offered by botanical gardens? And we, we provided a multiple choice response. Conservation science and other research, education and training programs, plant uh, exhibitions, preserving plant biodiversity and providing a, a, an oasis of nature within urban settings, right? We're all talking about people interacting with each other, interacting with the plants, and also learning and having fun doing it uh, during during this time. We're going to give the the uh, the final word uh, over to uh, to the center of the country. Um, uh, Brian, um, could you just sort of take us out? We're coming to the end of our time. Could you just um, if you had a message for all of us in terms of getting involved in the idea of growing things as being connected through the country, basically the health of the growing, uh, the state of growing things in the country actually reflects the health of the country itself. 
Um, what kind of a involvement should we all uh, have that would also bring us energy and, and bring us a return on that investment in time? Well, this may not be the answer you expect, um, but I would say we need to engage people and make them passionate about a bigger perspective about the world itself, about their own environment, their own community, um, nature. Um, and that really begins with humility. Um, we need to actually think less about this direction and more about that direction. And botanic gardens open up this incredible, almost spiritual capacity in people to connect to life beyond themselves. And we saw that profoundly during uh, the COVID nightmare when we most everything was shut down botanic gardens stayed open and people came to us for relief and rescue um, and we just hope that when they leave they take that spirit out into the community and make it a better place such an important point that is a great isn't that a great tony mary don't don't you think oh, did a great job yeah i'm not going to improve upon that I, yeah we're 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 stunned uh Mary Brenniger, President and CEO of the Dallas Arboretum, Tony Kalenic, of the Director of the Mathai Botanical Gardens, and Nicholas Arboretum at the University of Michigan, and Brian Vogt, CEO of the Denver Botanic Gardens. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I love the wide-ranging discussion. It just gives me added respect for the the kind of contribution that that you make to this country. We're so appreciative of, of your constituents, your staffs your donors, your institutions, and of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Everybody stay safe. Have a great day.